Welcome to episode number three of the Soccer Coaching Theory Podcast. Today we're going to be discussing affordances, invitations for actions, and intentions, and what that actually means in a soccer context in terms of player development at the various levels, and also what it means looking through the ecological dynamic lens. Now, remember that ecological dynamics is the academic theory that I connect all my practice session designs to, and ultimately, it, it's the theory that makes up my soccer methodology. Now, let's dive in here. The theory of ecological dynamics states that the information is always present, and there is a circular link between information and movement meaning the player is always in a real-time feedback loop with the environment. And it's through direct perception that information from the environment specifies invitations or opportunities for actions, which we will call an affordance. Now, these opportunities for action are available for pickup in a performance context, meaning in the game. It's always available. These action possibilities or affordances are specific to each athlete, and they don't last. They come and they go. Um, things don't stay the same in an unpredictable, chaotic, moving game like soccer. So let me give you an example. You see you know, a player has a chance to dribble into space, right? And... That space doesn't exist forever. At some point, an opponent is going to move into that space, and that invitation, that opportunity for action is going to go away. Or an opponent, you're going to try to dribble by a guy, they close you down. The opportunity to keep going forward, the affordance to keep going forward to score the goal is not on anymore. So what is the next invitation for action? Maybe to turn around and go the other direction because you had to, because one of the invitations for action had shut down. So players in the ecological dynamic environment, their intentions can shift very quickly from if Messi's going to go right and the defender goes right, his intention has to switch and he has to look in the environment for the current information and what is the next invitation for action? So now that we have a basic understanding that through direct perception in a real-time feedback loop that the environment provides us with these invitations for actions, it's based on player capability. And this is where it gets interesting as a coach. Can we create game representative environments that guide players to look for invitations for action? to solve problems in a new way on the field. So I believe that when players are guided through new ways to solve problems on the field, they become better. The old CEO of, of Yahoo once said something to the effect that the greatest works of art are fraught with constraints, meaning that absolute freedom doesn't breed creativity. In fact, it does the opposite. So think about this. If you always allow free play with no restrictions in practice, players will 99% of the time go about solving problems the same way over and over again. The left-footed player who relies solely on their left foot, only dribbles with their left foot, will probably end up going back to their left foot. And it reminds me of a story that Rob Gray told um, that stuck with me that pertains to this point. And he spoke about a rock climber who had amazing hand grip strength. And the, the climber would use pre, uh, predominantly hand holds to climb up the mountain. Then his coach made him wear mittens. And the environment was the same. Nothing had changed. The rock wall was the same exact rock wall. But the climber could no longer rely on their hands to support their entire body weight when climbing. So by using a constraint, the mittens, the climber now had to look for new footholds. The information through direct perception with the environment was always there. All the information was always there. But the invitation of action had now changed. The intentions 
have now changed. The climber needed to look for footholds. This changed the way that he climbed. And through that experience, he gained a new skill set that he would have never had experience before. So a major part of skill acquisition in ecological dynamics is accomplished by using a constraint-led approach. This is an approach that takes away some action possibilities while making other action possibilities um, available. So I'm going to cover, uh, cover the constraints-led approach in much more detail in the next episode. But a great deal of player development occurs by using the CLA approach, the constraints-led approach, both technical and tactical um, skill development. And these things don't operate uh, separately. These, are, these things are together. So let's continue this discussion about affordances, uh, intentions, invitations, and how that relates in the overall coaching. So let's look at a game model. And a game model is basically something that the coach decides on and translates to the players. It's basically the strategy, the formation, the tactics. It's about how the players carry out their strategy. You could call it a style of play. And the coach will work on this game model as the main feature of training. If you look at tactical periodization, everything is based off of the game model. I, I, the question that I, I would have, though, it, about game models is this, is when a coach creates a game model, how does this affect a player's intentions and perceived affordances, their shared affordances and their overall affordances? So are you allowing the player to think for themselves or does the game model have better solutions for your players? Are the players allowed to come up with their own solutions outside of the game model if the invitations for other types of actions are present? Or will the, will the, will the coach kind of crush the player for straying outside of the game model? So if we look at like a Red Bull game model, that Red Bull like Salzburg made you know, so famous, and you can see the Philly Union using this now, you can see so many teams, Red Bull New York, and this high pressing model. So I remember going to watch their academy. It was a U14, U12, whatever it was. And you have the 12, 13 year old kids in the academy and they're pressing in numbers. They're being encouraged to play long balls forward into the box where, where they would counter press and sit off of that second ball with wasn't a major priority because it takes away from the uh, effectiveness of, of counter pressing and everything was about can we get the ball forward we don't even need the ball but we want the ball in in the attacking third and then we're going to counter press so it's a very effective method it 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 but the thing for me is it's a bit robotic right and each player has their defined role in the team, and the tactics are rigid. It requires a huge work rate. Psychologically, you have to buy into this as a player because the ball is not the priority. It's And a lot of players now are trained where the ball is their passion. So you have to kind of psychologically be okay with the beautiful game turning into this high-pressing, chaotic thing. So my main concern with this strict type of game model, I'm just using this as an example is just like the mountain climber only looking for handholds to climb the mountain, the climber is missing so many other invitations for action. The Red Bull game model is so strict that what are the players missing, right? Are they missing all these other invitations for actions? And what does this do to their player development if they're trained this way from a kid? So... We're, we're also taking, with these strict game models, we're taking the opinion that probably the game model and the coach has better solutions than the players. And what I would say is this. Let's take a look at opportunities for action, the affordances. Everybody has different affordances. But as a coach, do you think you could possibly tell what every player's affordances are in every moment of the game? I mean, look at Messi, right? 
Think about it. We have no idea what he is capable of in all moments of the game. So why constrain his intentions and action capabilities with a strict game model? So when you look at the younger age groups too, isn't there a need to let players explore and make their own decisions? If your game model is too restrictive, then players' action capabilities may start to suffer. It may be harder for them to develop because they are literally not thinking for themselves. They are perceiving their affordances through the lens of a constraining game model. That is a little bit problematic for me. In an ideal world, what, what I would like is a flexible game model that can be adjusted by players to fit who they are and who are they playing with, and who are they playing against. Now, I like Pep Guardiola's positional grid. It is really, for me, a map drawn on the field of intentions. Invitations for action, in a sense, but it's more intentions. It literally says, in this area, we focus your attention towards these type of actions. Because these type of actions in this area ultimately lead to more goals, which is the idea of the game. That being said, how can we adapt, say, something like Guardiola's positional grid to make it more flexible in nature, allowing players more action capabilities and more freedom? So let's consider like the box on top of the box in, in, in Guardiola's positional grid. It's basically a penalty box drawn on top of the penalty box, right? And that's the place where the most defenders on the field are located. It's super compact. We call this the one touch area. It's a fast area. One of the one of the intentions here is to play one touch because it's very compact. But let's be real. Special players could still dribble and they could still score. They could kill it. They could do anything they want in that area. So why tell Messi you have to play one touch in that area? You don't have to. It's for me, that's the point about being a flexible game model. It's a framework that can be broken depending on the affordances of your team and each player. And listen, I, I, I like what Guardiola did over time, too, with certain players. For me, when Kyle Walker first got to Man City, he played Walker inside, 15 yards inside. So he took away Walker's width. He pushed the center back. He pushed the defensive center mid over towards Walker. So he never had to make more than a 12 or 15-yard pass. He didn't allow him to get forward that much. Perfect. Walker was a great defender. He took away a lot of his um, ability for actions. But as Walker improved, you saw he played him wider and encouraged him to get down the line. So as Walker's ability for actions, his skill set improved, I believe that Guardiola adjusted um, his role and let him have more freedom. So let me make one last point with intentions. If you're a coach and you're yelling from the sideline and kind of joysticking the game, what, what you're really doing is causing players to constantly be switching their attention to what you're yelling about. And what if the coach's information is crappy, right? Then the entire thing goes into a big mess and it hinders development. For me, skilled coaching is more about guiding players' intentions so they still have to look for the action capabilities. They have to look for the invitations for actions themselves, but you can kind of guide them to where those might be. But giving the exact answer, you don't have to do. Now, I'm not saying that if there's a guy in the box on a free kick that's that's not marked, that you can't say, hey, listen, you've got to mark up number five. And it's very, you know, you're giving them the answer, but that's very important. I'm more talking about decisions. I'm more talking about focusing their attention so they can recognize maybe there's some spaces here, maybe there's some spaces there. But at the end of this whole conversation, there's not one way to score a goal. There's a million different decisions, different ways to go about scoring a goal. So for me, soccer is a player's game. It's not a game where the coach has to tell the players where to pass every ball. 
that will start to focus their attention in places that you don't want them to focus their attention because they have to learn how to do them this themselves without you. You could actually become a crutch for the players if you're constantly talking through the game the whole time. They have to learn how to do these things themselves. So I hope you enjoyed episode number three. It might have been a little all over the place, but these are the discussions that are very important in terms of coaching and player development. So as always, remember to connect academic theory to practice session design. I'll be talking about the constraint-led approach in, a, in an ecological environment in the next episode. I want you to enjoy your Christmas, enjoy your coaching. Until next time, happy holidays. See you later. Coach D.